Howdy! My name is Nonat, and welcome to something long overdue. A few months back, I did a Pathfinder 2e class tier list, and you guys... Yeah, you kinda like that one. So I'm back with the obvious sequel I should've done months ago... Ancestries. Which one's the best, which one's the worst, all in my definitive... opinion. But before we get into the tier list, we have a massive announcement. Sinclair's library, the Kickstarter, is officially launching on May 3rd. No more delays, no more vague dates. May 3rd, we are going live. You will be able to pledge, you'll be able to see all of our available tiers, and you'll be able to help us really hit our goal. And it'd be really cool if we could hit the listed goal within tw- <laughs> Pringles can. Within 24 hours. There is a link in the description to our mailing list, or if you're watching this after May 3rd, there is a link to the Kickstarter itself. And remember, if you sign up for the mailing list and pledge to the Kickstarter within 48 hours of it going live, you get a free dice set regardless of your tier amount. You can pledge the bottom tier, you can pledge the top tier. If you signed up for the mailing list and pledged in 48 hours or less, you get the Bandit dice set completely for free. And trust me guys, this supplement is going to blow you away. We haven't even done the Kickstarter yet, and I'm already flabbergasted by what my design team has brought out. Look, we got a Cage Fighter, we got a Curse Breaker, we got a Leshy with a Whip! I hope you're as excited as I am. You're probably not, but I hope you're at least half as excited as I am. Click the links in the description, check out the Kickstarter. Thank you so much for letting us do this. On with the tier list. Welcome to the tier list on Tier Maker, and before we get into it, I'm not taking credit for this. This tier list was made by at Museum Bad on Twitter. They have all the ancestries and, as a bonus, all the versatile heritages. So, in order to say thank you to them, go over to at Museum Bad, give them a follow on Twitter. But now, let's get started with Asimar. Nope, let's not get started. Just kidding. You might notice there's two S tiers S for adorable and S for cool. That's because I have multiple different genre, genres? Judgments I make when talking about an ancestry. Something super cool doesn't deserve to be in the same tier as something super adorable. So I'm going to classify them in the two different tiers. There's no A tier because I replaced the A tier with an S tier, so don't worry about it. There's S adorable, S cool, B, C, D, and then F because the American grading system is stupid. <laughs> Can you imagine if we got S's in school? Like, you did so good, you got an S rank. I kind of feel awesome. No more wasting time. Asimar. Asimar are really cool. I think they're a little overdone only because they've been around so long. They were really popular in 5th edition? Were Asimar in 5th edition? I don't know why. I just feel like in my decade playing TTRPGs, I've seen Asimar everywhere, and they're cool. But I think what honestly limits them for me is the fact that Asimar are just beautiful. Like, it is in their description that they are a super gorgeous, beautiful type of people. So I'm going to put them in C tier. I don't dislike them. I think they're a cool idea. I, they're just not for me. Androids. Jumping into uncommon or rare already. Uh, androids are awesome. I think they've been handled really well in Pathfinder 2e, really differentiating them from something like an automaton or D&D's Warforged. I think androids already S-tier cool ancestry, because they're not just a robot. There is a soul inside. They were built and a soul was shoved into them or the soul was converted into a machine. I don't remember exactly. It's one of the two. Either one, super cool. Their feats are super flavorful. They have this whole like nanite thing. They feel like a Starfinder character made their way into Pathfinder and I love that. Aphorites don't do it for me. I'm not gonna lie. I like that they have expanded beyond Asimar and Tiefling, and now we're starting to get, like, they're basically Asimar, but lawful instead of good. You know, instead of being an angel, they're from the, the plane of Axis, I think it's called. Unfortunately, I find the ancestry really boring, but I think that's kind of by design. They're lawful. They're not supposed to be exciting. They're supposed to be consistent and reliable and F-tier. Azar Keddy. This is a weird one that a lot of you have maybe not even ever heard about, because the Azar Keddy weren't released in any major supplement. I don't even know what book they came out in, or if it was just an online release? 
But the Azarkati are mer people. They live underwater, and in fact, they have to be in water once every 24 hours, I think. Otherwise, they start to effectively uh, starve like other beings that need to eat. Azarkati are cool. I think I'm going to put them right next to Asimar and C tier. They've got a lot of flavor. What they, The flavor they have really fits their story. I'm just not that interested in mer people. So if you are, they should definitely rank higher. But for me, I, I recognize the effort put in. I recognize what they're supposed to be. I just don't care. Beastkin! Can I just slide a Beastkin, like, right here in between the two? Because depending on how you build them, Beastkin can be adorable or cool. I'm gonna lean closer towards cool, just because, I, especially with the art they give, I love the flexibility and versatility of the Beastkin. You can pick literally any animal you want to be your Beastkin other half. You're effectively, this is a versatile heritage, so it attaches to any ancestry, so you can almost literally be, you could be an elephant. I just thought of that off the top of my head, an elf elephant. You can be an elephant. you can be a dwarf raptor, a dwapter, you can be a gnome horse. Don't look that up. Beastkin are cool, you can make them adorable, you can make them awesome. For me, they're gonna lean a little bit more into cool, just because I love everything about them. My only complaint is that their shape-shifting abilities are really weak for the level you get them, but it's an ancestry, they kinda have to be. Catfolk, also known as a Morin. I have no problems with this ancestry, I really like it, I think it's done incredibly well, the flavor is there. My biggest complaint, and it's gonna hold them in C tier and not S tier, why don't they have 35-foot movement speed, Paizo? They're cats. Cats are some of the fastest mammals on the planet. Why are elves faster than catfall? Low-key, this one took me forever to figure out what it was, this picture. I should probably stop moving it around so I can zoom in on it. This is a changeling, but I think it's the Pathfinder 1st Edition changeling art, so I couldn't find it anywhere in my 2E books, and I'm like, what are you? But this is the changeling. Changelings are fine. They're not what you think they are at first glance. When you hear changeling, you might think a shapeshifter or a mimic or something like that, but no, a changeling is the descendant of a witch, at least in the Pathfinder universe. I think more specifically a hag, and they hear the call of the coven, and that's what's gonna keep them out of D tier and put them in C tier, is specifically the flavor regarding the call. No matter whether you're a, a male or female changeling, you will, as you grow up as a person, begin to hear the call. It's stronger in females, and it will call you to return and join and strengthen the coven that your ancestor was a part of, even if that means doing some evil things, because covens don't tend to be good things, and I love that flavor, just everything else about the changeling I don't really care about, their feats didn't impress me, uh, none of it really stuck with me. I, I do like how whichever uh, lineage feat you take at level 1 changes your eye color, that's kind of cool, uh, but that's about it. Dom Pier, easy B tier. Uh, I like having a character with negative healing, and aside from the new undead creatures, that's really hard to do, and it's a fun game mechanic, you know? Healing off negative, hurting off positive can lead to some really interesting fights. You know, your, your GM can actually throw some positive energy clerics at the party, and they can hurt you, uh, or you can heal yourself with some really interesting spells, uh, even if you're not necessarily a cleric. Anything that does uh, negative healing can heal you, which is really cool, uh, and you're immune to negative damage. Neat. Duskwalker! Pretty similar to Dom Pier on my personal scale, but I don't know why. When I think about Duskwalker, I think what I love is just the connection to Phrasma. Flavor-wise, they are amazing for me. I love having a heritage directly connected to a specific deity. It's really great for character development, character motivation, especially because the lore of the Duskwalkers is you were brought back on purpose by Phrasma, like for a reason. So right out the gate when you make a Duskwalker, you can talk to your GM and give your character a purpose. Why were they brought back? What is the reason they are there? Why are they with the party? I had a person join halfway through a campaign and they made a Duskwalker and I'm like, oh, perfect. Phrasma saw the party struggling because they were fighting a freaking lich and they were like, yo, Duskwalker champion. Go help him out! And my player was like, awesome. Like, straight up champion of Phrasma, Duskwalker. It worked perfectly. Uh, I couldn't tell you anything about their feats. I don't really know much. I know they get the cool super arrow once per day at high levels. That's all I remember. But otherwise, uh, they're just cool. Dwarves. Dwarves hold a special place in my heart. They're going in S tier strictly because of my personal experience with them. 
they are fine. Mechanically, they're fine. I do love their earth magic and their connection to the, to the ground. I think that is represented so well in Pathfinder 2e, especially with the spells like meld into stone they get from their ancestry feats. But my first real D&D character ever in an actual campaign was named Jorv. He was a cleric. He was a dwarf. He was so freaking stubborn, and I love him and still think about him to this day. S tier. Elves. Elves are overrated, don't at me, D-tier. Look at yourself. Look at your character. Tell me you didn't play Elf just for that five-foot speed bonus. Look deep inside yourself. You know you did. Fetchlings! Fetchlings were really, really cool when they were released and announced, but then everyone's like, oh, you're kind of just like an edgy Dom Peer without negative healing, because they're from the Shadow Plane and they get some shadow magic, I think, in their ancestry feats, but they were kind of like a flash in the pan with the APG. Did you know they came out? Or was it the ancestry guide? I don't even remember what book these guys are from. Look, just stop trying to make fetchlings happen. They're not gonna happen. Flesh warps, on the other hand, are going high B tier. I don't think they're quite S tier for me, but I just love the idea. It's a unique, versatile heritage. I think it has the rare trait. What I love about the Flesh Warp is their heritage is how they were made. Were they made by a necromantic ritual? Were they like stitched together? Were they born this way? They have a bunch of different options. My girlfriend is playing a Flesh Warp in our campaign right now, and it's super cool. You can get all these unique, just little gross flesh distortions, and I really love the characters you can make with a Flesh Warp. This is also one that I forget exists whenever I want to make a character. So whenever I see someone playing a Flesh Warp, I'm like, that's amazing and super cool. But whenever I'm making a character, I forget it exists. Gonzi. Gonzi are the first going in S for adorable. Gonzi, for some reason, is on every character I make now. Ever since it came out in... I think that was also the Ancestry Guide as a versatile heritage, which is, these are the Asimars, but for chaos. So you've got Asimar good, Tiefling evil, uh, Aphorite lawful, and then Gonzi chaos. Chaos? Chaotic. <laughs> uh, and I just love them. Their feats are so cool. You can grow a tail. You can just be good at performing. Uh, it lets you have like the split down the middle. You can make different parts of your body look cool. On my halfling, uh, Barley, he's a Gonzi, and just his left arm is like green and scaly. It only has four fingers instead of five. Uh, but you can see the goblin picture has like the half blue, half green, and like. I just love the Gonzi. I don't know if I could ever make like a super cool badass Gonzi. I probably could if I wanted to, but I just always make them adorable. And for some reason, I've made them all small races. My Both of my Gonzi characters have been halflings and gnomes. I don't know why. I think I just like it. Speaking of which, gnomes, which most people would probably put in S for adorable, but no, gnomes are going in S for cool because of the bleaching and how dark the story of the gnomes is. The gnomes in Pathfinder are amazing. Their connection to the first world, the bleaching, meaning if they don't keep themselves interested, they will die of lack of experience. Gnomes are awesome. End of story. I'm just, I'm just going to put this here. I'm not going to give an explanation because I like to watch you squirm. Half elf. Um, I don't know why I consider these are considered different versatile heritages, not like half gnome, half halfling. Quarterling? But half elf, I'll just put it in. I think for the sake of the system, I'm gonna put both half elf and half orc in D tier, because they're not overall that special, because you can do half anything. I guess these two are just special because there are specific half elf and half orc feats. Think about that, I'll put the half elf at the top of D tier, strictly that one feat that gives you haste once a day for free. It's insanely powerful, uh, and so I will put that in D tier. Halflings, really fun, not quite S tier like gnomes, but I like that their their social nature is written into their, their, their lore and their history. Uh, I really like how they painted halflings. I like that they have the luck, they have bad luck, they have a lot of different ways to aid people as well as even communicating with their party members in unique ways. Uh, halfling is really high B tier for me. I don't think it's quite S tier. 
Habo Gabo, really high C tier. I don't see myself ever making a Hobgoblin, but I love their feet, that they're all like inherent army commanders. They can buff and heal their allies, give everyone like super flanking bonuses. Again, some of them are limited only to other Hobgoblins, which I think should be eroded or homebrewed and affect any ally. Come on, Paizo, not everyone wants to play Hobgoblins. I think they're well designed. I love what they did with it. I just don't see myself playing it. High C tier. Humans, you're too strong. You do not deserve S tier, but I will give you mid to high B tier, strictly for your mechanical versatility that in reality should belong to all ancestries. I get it, the humans need something to make them unique, but making their unique thing infinite versatility? Kind of unfair. I mean, come on. What's one of their heritages? Like, general training? It's actually a feat, but still, why isn't a feat like general training available to other ancestries. You just get a free general feat at level one, which normally you have to wait till level three. Why can only humans do general training? Or like focusing on one skill with the skilled heritage. I don't know. I don't know. Humans, I hate how versatile you are, but I love playing you. So whatever, mid to high B tier. If free, do you want to be a fireman who fights fire with fire? Pick a freet. Um, C tier. Again, I don't see myself playing them. I'm gonna have, I'll spoil it, you know, let's do it all right now. The, the Ifrit, the Undyne, the Sylph, and once again, they use the Pathfinder first edition art, but yeah, the Oread as well. Just the four elemental ones. I did not like their feet design overall. They were very underwhelming. And I, I guess if you wanna make a super earthy elf or a super watery human, you can do that. I just think there's more interesting things out there, and I'd rather take something like Gonzi or Flesh Warp over just a little bit of elementalism. So those four are all going to go at the exact same spot of C tier. Kitsune! This is going to say a lot more about me than I'd like to admit. Kobolds! Adorable. They're super cool. I love their focus on trapping and cowering and being a quote-unquote lesser being, being more of a facade than a fact. Uh, kobolds have been so well designed in Pathfinder 2e, and you may not like their shark heads, but I do. Leshies! Leshies, again, S tier adorable. What do you want me to say? You can play as a strawberry! Their feet design are awesome. The amount of different types of leshies you can make are incredible because it's not like one, it's not like there's a strawberry heritage. There's a berry heritage. Are you a strawberry? Are you a blueberry? Are you a blackberry? Are you a mango? It's up to you. Like you can do so much with each individual heritage of leshy that it feels like five different ancestries in one. Lizard Folk, as attractive as you've been made in the artwork for this game, I'm gonna give you low B tier. I once again remember being very unimpressed by the Lizard Folk ancestry feats, especially because they were so focused on their unarmed attacks, but any class that's going to be focused on unarmed attacks are going to have better options, except maybe a fighter. So unless you are a fighter Lizard Folk, you're not going to get a lot of mileage out of those feats. They've got some other cool stuff. They've got bone magic, of course, and they've got all the other innuendo feats that Pathfinder came out for them. Uh, overall, I don't dislike them. They're still in B tier. They're just at the bottom of B tier. Orc. Do you want a lot of hit points? Play an orc. Otherwise, uh, you don't die once per day. Bottom of C tier. The Panol, written by Logan Bonner. I like that they included this in here, even though it's technically homebrew. But, you know, Logan Bonner wrote it, so it deserves to be on this list. I think I'm going to put the Banal right in the middle of B tier. It's adorable. I don't think I've actually put a lot of time into reading their feats, so this is strictly off of just looking at them and what they are. They're adorable. Do you want to play as a little mole person? Play a Banal. Ratfolk. Is there a question? Ratfolk are, like, near the top of S tier adorable. The Ratfolk in Pathfinder 2e, the art is adorable, their feats are flavorful, their descriptions and lore are amazing and just, they're just so cute! The, the fact that they're like, they're similar to halflings in that they're they're sociable people people but at the same time there's so much family connection for them you know they live in giant interconnected hives is not the white word there are no mouse hives 
societies and communities of like 50 to 100 Yosoki that just know each other. They're basically one massive family. Sometimes they go out on the adventure, and that's honestly the hardest part of making a rat folk is trying to justify why your rat folk left their community to go on an adventure. Trust me, it's harder than it sounds, and they're adorable. Shuni. Oh, so many people want Shuni in S tier. I can't do it. I just can't do it. Nothing about the Shuni has ever really stuck with me personally, aside from them being an adorable dog person. And I think it means less to me because I own a TTRPG called Pugmire, where you can just play as any kind of dog. I'm not kidding. This is real. I've owned this for five years, and I've never gotten to play it. So it might just be less impressive to me that the dogs are playable in Pathfinder. I do think they're cute, the art's adorable, and I remember seeing a lot of cool flavor for them, but that was a long time ago, and I've never... Ugh, guess. And I've never actually gone back to read them, so... High B tier for the sake of the community and how cute they are, but they don't get any higher. Sprites. I like a sprite, but only if I'm playing a mounted character. This is strictly due to Pathfinder 2E's mount rules saying you use your mount's location when attacking instead of your own. And overall, eh, there's, they're really limited. In case you're unaware, sprites can only attack if they are sharing a space with something, and that's super limiting. I think sprites are gonna get high C tier next to hobgoblins. I like what they did with it. I like what you can make with them. Their feats and their heritages, once again, have a lot of flavor, a lot of cool stuff going on with their size specifically. They actually introduced mounted player combat rules where you can like sit on someone's shoulder and fight and share initiative, which is super cool. But overall, high C tier. Strix, has anybody actually played a Strix? I've never even heard of anybody playing a Strix. They're basically just... <sighs> Pathfinder 2E has two bird ancestries. One is a bird person, one is a person bird. This is a person bird, and it's going in D tier. The Suli are going slightly above the other four elemental, uh, the, 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 the water bowl dog drink. Are you that thirsty? It's not going that much higher, it's going bottom of B tier, but I just like the idea of a versatile heritage that is just, you are imbued with all elements. You're not necessarily a master, you know, you're not Avatar or anything, but you yourself can access all of the elements literally within your blood and your genealogy, rather than just one. I don't know, it's a little bit cooler, like I said, it's not gonna skyrocket it into S tier, but it will sneak into the bottom of B tier. Tengu, if we talked about the person bird, here is the bird person, and it's going to the top of C tier. Tengu, to me, are a lot more interesting than the Strix. The Strix are just sort of like humans with wings, whereas the Tengu are just birds with arms. The Tengu is really cool. I like them. My girlfriend played one. I've considered playing one. I've theorycrafted a few. I love their inherent connection with lightning magic, which is just neat. It's like the Tengu, I think, have a lot of connection to the skies and the winds, which, you know, the lightning is wind magic. Science. I just like their flavor. I can say this all day, six ways to Sunday. I also just like their design, their massive beaks, and unlike a certain D&D &D bird person, they're not restricted to just mimicking. Tiefling. I would have put Tiefling in D tier, because I am a hipster and Tieflings are so heavily overdone, I am sick of seeing them. But Pathfinder 2E has done Tieflings in a good light. The art is not super cliche. It's very, very different. I mean, you can even see here we have like the Tiefling cleric pastor looking guy, which I appreciate. Uh, I like that they have different feats to give you like horns or hooves. You don't just get to pick your demon parts. You have to take a feat that determines which type of demon part you inherited. I love that. I'm gonna put that also on the top of C tier right next to sprites and hobgoblins. The Anadi! Oh, Anadi are going tippy tippy top of B tier. They're not quite going into S tier for adorable, even though they kind of deserve it, but I love them. I think the thing that keeps them out is that, like, Beastkin 
you can be a person and an animal, and your animal can be anything. A naughty, you're a person and an animal, but you're always a spider. This does mean that the feats they get are much more spider specific, and they can go more in depth with that animal. But I think I like the freedom of the beastkin over the restriction of the anadi. But if you want to play a spider beastkin, I say go all the way and play an anadi. I think you'll have a lot more interesting choices. Kanrasu, S tier, super cool. You are playing a tree. The end. Knolls! People were so excited to see that Knolls existed. And like, they're cool, don't get me wrong, but like, they're just a Knoll. I guess I'd put them near goblins for me personally. They're they're fine. I, they're not they're not above a goblin. There's no way they're above goblins. Um, there's, goblins are above these guys too. What am I saying? There we go. Knolls are fine. I like that they're a playable character. They're not an ancestry I've ever had a lot of personal interest with, but I'm glad we have rules for them and people can play and make one if they want to. So yeah, that's about middle of C tier as you can get. I'm happy you can play it. I don't really care, but I think it's a good ancestry. Goloma. Strictly for creativity, middle of B tier. They're definitely above humans. The Goloma, living human horse people with like a thousand eyes and feats that make you better at seeing things. Super duper cool. I love the idea that they were such, they're cowardly people. They're they're afraid and because they're, they're low on the food chain, or at least they used to be, so much to the point that they evolved eyes in the back of their head to see predators coming. And I just think that's Cool, B tier. Gripply. I haven't read the Gripply. What book did Gripply come in? Ancestry Guide? No. Mwangi? I think Mwangi. For the sake of everything and credibility, I'm just gonna put Gripply at the bottom of B tier. I think I would normally put them higher because I love frog people and look at him, he's adorable. But for the sake of being fair and I don't know their mechanics, I don't know their in-game lore, I'm gonna leave them at bottom of B tier. The Shisk are hilarious. They're gonna go in the middle of C tier, right next to Goblins. I think uh, playing a Shisk in a full campaign would be difficult. Playing them in a one-shot could be a lot of fun, almost like you could make a very easy meme character with a Shisk, because Shisks are porcupine people. They have spikes growing all throughout their body. And before you leave that nerdy comment, yes, I know their quills are calcified feathers, you heathen but I like to call them porcupine people because they're basically spikes. And so they can't really sit in chairs. They can't like wear draped clothing like a cloak or a blanket or anything because they're sharp quills. So like it would be fun to role play for a few sessions, but I think it would get really old. Like you would need specific sleeping arrangements. You wouldn't like, if you got a new set of armor, how do you put that on? You have quills sticking out your back. It's hard enough to put a hat on when you have product in your hair. <laughs> Middle of C tier. I like what they did. I just don't know. And I want to play one. I just don't know if I can play one for a whole campaign. Poppets. S tier for cool. I think the Poppet is a super underrated, for the wrong reason, ancestry. Sure, everybody talks about the Poppet. Everyone loves the Poppet because you can play a living teddy bear. But people do not put enough thought into how cool you could make a Poppet. First off, you don't have to be tiny. You can be small. You can be a large toy soldier. And beyond that, you, the story you can have behind a Poppet can be so dark, can be so interesting. You're effectively a ghost given form sometimes. You can be a ghost given form. You can be similar to a, a robot who just is programmed and built for something and you have no idea why. There are so many directions you can take a Poppet player character and that's what gets it S tier for cool. And finally, Automaton. Is it fair to give Android S an Automaton B? I think so. I think I find the Android more interesting than the Automaton because it's still like a living creature, whereas the Automaton is much more just constructed robot. They're still cool. Their feats are awesome. They've unlocked the ability to play Laser Monk, but overall, I don't know oh, if, if I play an Automaton, it'll probably be a one shot. Heck, I've already done that once. It was a lot of fun. But I think I would, if I was gonna play a long form campaign, I would sooner play an Android than an Automaton. And I think that leaves it in B tier under Flesh Warp.
And there we have it. There is the official No Not Ones Ancestry tier list. Go ahead, yell at me, insult me in the comments, tell me how Aphorite's my favorite ancestry. How dare you only put that one in F tier? <laughs> I don't know why. I don't even hate them like that much, but that just feels like where they belong. But there you have it. Let me know down in the description your thoughts, and please do not forget to sign up for the Sinclair's Library Kickstarter using the link in the description. May 3rd, May 3rd, May 3rd. Everything is set into motion, and we're so excited to share it with you. So thank you so very much for watching. I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day, and until next time, no nat ones. Oh my god, patrons! Patrons, you exist! I'm tired and I haven't made a video in like seven days. Patrons, put them on screen. Throw them away. Put them on screen again to say sorry. Throw them away. End of video.